Hey friends, it's Alex here at the Code Wolf again. And in this video, we're going to take a look at the new features for Blazor in the upcoming .NET 8 release. Now, one of the biggest new features is called server-side rendering, but I actually already covered that in another video on my channel, so check that out if you're interested. Server-side rendering is a bit more of an involved topic, so we're not gonna focus on that here. Instead, we're gonna look at some smaller or miscellaneous features that might help you out when you're building your apps. Please remember to hit subscribe if you enjoy this content, and now let's take a look at those features. Now, to get started with Blazor in .NET 8, you'll need to download the preview version from .NET.Microsoft.com slash next. I'm using Preview 4 for this video, but whatever the latest preview is when you watch this will probably work. Otherwise, you can also download and install the specific version if you want to follow along. I'm also going to be using Visual Studio Code for this demo, so you can download that or use whatever editor and terminal you prefer. So here I have an out-of-the-box Blazor WebAssembly template created using the .NET new Blazor WASM command. And if you do this from the CLI like this with the preview version installed, it will give you the latest project template. You can verify you're on the right version by looking in the csproj file where it should say .NET 8. So to start with, one really nice feature added to Blazor in .NET 8 is sections. If you've worked with Razor Pages or MVC, this concept might be familiar, and it works basically the same way now in Blazor. Sections allow you to define areas of markup in your main wrapper layout that can be overridden from the pages or components nested inside of them. So for instance, here in our main layout, let's say we want to add a footer that can be overridden by any component in our app. That way we can add custom messages here on different pages or at different states. The code for this is really simple. We just have to add the new section outlet component and give that a section name of footer section or something. Now, from what I can tell, there is no option to add default content here if a component chooses not to override the section, but we'll see if that gets added soon. Next, let's switch over to one of our page components, such as the index component, and see how to override that layout footer. Down at the bottom of our code, let's add a companion component called section content and assign a matching section name of footer section, which is how Blazor knows which section to override. Then we can just put some new content in here that says hello from the home page or something identifiable. Let's then copy this code snippet and move over to another component, such as our counter, and paste that in at the bottom as well. Just make sure to update the message to something different so we can see the change happen. That's really all there is to it, so let's run the app and make sure that this works. Now, at the time of this recording, I've been running into some issues with .NET Watch working properly for the latest preview features, so I'm going to stick with the good old fashioned .NET Run to avoid any weirdness here. So just execute .NET Run and let that start up for a second. When our site loads, on the home page, we can see that index component content. So far, so good. The footer section was populated successfully for the index page. Let's switch over to our counter page now, and sure enough, there we can see the updated message in our footer as well. This is a great feature that simplifies communication between the parent layout and your components. Now, back in VS Code, let's stop the app and look at another small quality of life feature. Blazor now supports properly scrolling to elements on the page via their ID attribute if a matching anchor segment is included in the URL. Surprisingly, this does not work in previous versions of Blazor, something you may or may not have noticed before. To effectively demo this, we need to make sure our page is tall enough to be scrollable. So let's add a quick style to our footer, such as margin top equals 1500 pixels or something like that to push it further down the page and just make sure to add an ID such as footer. This would obviously not be appropriate styling in a real app, but it works for now. Let's run the app again and verify that this is working. So back in the browser, our page is now quite a bit longer, and in the address bar, let's add a pound sign with an ID of footer, and now when we hit enter, sure enough, this will scroll down to that section. It's great to see this working now in .NET 8. Now, heading back to VS Code, let's look at a more significant new feature called Quick Grid. This feature actually existed as an early preview in .NET 7, if you remember, but now it's been officially added to .NET 8 and it's undergone some structural changes. Quick Grid essentially provides a basic grid view component out of the box with a surprising number of features. 
This is sort of an interesting addition to Blazor, since currently the framework doesn't provide that many out-of-the-box UI components that generate large blocks of HTML and functionality for you. Usually we've relied on third-party libraries for these features. So the first thing you'll need to do is install the microsoft.aspnetcore.components.quickgrid package and make sure to add the pre-release flag to that. This is only necessary while we're in preview. Then in your imports file, include the matching namespace so it's available across your project. I've actually already set up a grid component here, so let's take a look at how this works and focus on some key concepts. Learning the specific syntax of every feature and variation of this component is well beyond the scope of this video. The important part is just to get a sense of how this works. First, we define a quick grid component and provide it a data source, which in this case is an in-memory object. This data is retrieved from an external web service, which we'll look at in a moment. And then we simply add a column for each property on the corresponding data object that we're representing in the grid. In this example, I'm using a publicly available Amiibo API to retrieve a list of cool little Nintendo action figures and setting columns for their properties, such as the name and game series. You can use the title attribute to set a display name and the property attribute to specify which model property to display. We're also declaring these columns as sortable. Interestingly, you can also use the template column to customize how a given column is rendered. So in this case, we're creating an image tag to display the Amiibo image correctly using its URL. We also have a paginator component to handle paging, another example of the built-in features that come with QuickGrid. Further down in the file, we have the logic to retrieve that data and populate the grid. First, we define a couple of C-sharp records that match the response data structure from the API. We can see what that response looks like over in the browser where I have a sample request open. This API is a little bit awkward in the sense that it adds this top-level Amiibo wrapper property to hold an array of Amiibos, so we have to mirror that in our code classes, but otherwise it's a pretty simple data structure, and I've just captured a handful of the properties on our C-sharp record. Back in VS Code, we then use the getFromJSONAsync method to make an HTTP request to that endpoint. We also want to make sure to convert that request data to a queryable for QuickGrid to support various features like paging and filtering. So this setup demonstrates a handful of QuickGrid features, but now let's run the app and see what this actually looks like in the browser. So when the site loads, I'll navigate over to the grid page. Sure enough, our simple grid view of Amiibos loads in. You can use paging along the bottom to view more characters or click the column headers to sort the items. All of this just comes out of the box with QuickGrid. It's a really great feature. I recommend checking out the demo site as well for all the details of what this component package can do. We have access to sorting, filtering, paging, virtualization, custom styles, the list just goes on. The documentation here is pretty good and even provides some sample Razor and CSS code. Just reference this for whatever scenario comes up for you. It looks like documentation for this is also being added to the official Microsoft docs, so keep an eye out for those updates as well. Now there are a few other new features of Blazor that aren't very interesting from a demo perspective, but are still worth mentioning. Hot Reload now supports additional code edit scenarios, meaning there are fewer cases where you have to fully restart the app to see your changes. Although I'm currently seeing some issues with Hot Reload, I'm sure these will be ironed out by the full release. Blazor WebAssembly debugging also now works in Firefox and even supports symbol servers if for some reason you need to use those. Blazor WebAssembly performance has also been improved and even makes use of a JIT interpreter automatically to improve some low-level performance in some scenarios, though an in-depth discussion of that is beyond the scope of this video. So that's all for now for Blazor and .NET 8. Please hit subscribe to support the channel, and I'll be posting more .NET 8 content very soon. I'll see you there next time.